I'm a junior in high school, and I'm a part of the youth group here at First Baptist Jonesboro, and I'm going to be reading the scripture today, so if you'll stand with me as I read from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, there, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Please be seated. It's good to be with you this morning. This is actually the last Sunday before Pastor Mel comes back. And so I'm just here to prepare the way for his return with you next week. But we've been in a series uh, on I am with you. God says I am with you when you mess up. I'm with you when you're making decisions. And I want to carry on that theme with you this morning. Um, I wonder, though, how many of you have ever had a, a season in your life where you were experiencing failure? You, you knew that God wanted you to do something. You knew that something would be good to do but you just couldn't do it. Uh, maybe it's just walking past those Krispy Kremes in the life group areas, and you keep intending next time not to partake, but this isn't the time. And uh, for me, uh, when COVID struck, uh, I do a lot of travel, and COVID just shut down all of my travel, or a lot of my travel. And so I had over 100 trips canceled. And so suddenly I was home a lot, and so I thought, well, I wanna redeem the time. Instead of looking at the problem, I want to find the possibility. And the possibility for me was uh, several in my family, were, were in a, we have a running club. And I was the weak link in the running club. Uh, there were others, my wife, my son, that were knocking off half marathons and marathons. And I, was, you know, I would try to run a couple of kilometers just to add to our team total. But I thought, you know what, now that I'm home, I should be able to run at least a 5K several days a week just in our neighborhood. And so I began trying that, and I would go out with the best of intentions. I'd gotten the best shoes and uh, the best gear that I could get, and there's just no excuse for me not running a 5K run. But something would always happen. Uh, after maybe a mile, I would hit a hill. And in our, where we live, in our subdivision, some of you know Walt and, and Nancy Mather, their house is in our neighborhood, our subdivision, and it's right at the end of a very long incline. We actually call that part of the road Mather Hill. We've, we call it other things when we're actually running up Mather Hill. And Mather Hill would get me every solitary time. I love the Mathers, I don't love their hill. And so I, I'd be running and, and I, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good today. You know, the weather's pretty nice out, I'm feeling good. And, and then I'd hit Mather Hill. And inevitably, I would just, I'd look at how far that hill was going and I'd start to ache and creak. And, and I would eventually, I would think, you know what, I think I'm just gonna walk the rest of the way up Matthew. Well, once you start walking, it's hard to start running again. And I'd try to run, and then I'd hit another rough stretch. And time after time, I couldn't run 5K. And I'd, I'd be embarrassed. I'd, I'd be just mad at myself. And uh, how did I get so out of shape? And why can't I do this? And, and so one Sunday, I was here at church, and my son Daniel, was, was, I was sitting next to him, and he said, so how's your running coming? And uh, I said, Daniel, I just can't do it. 
I just can't do it. It's just too hard. He said, Dad, it's not too hard. He said, you're, you're, you're physically, you're more than capable of running five kilometers. It's all in your head. Your head is just convincing you you can't do that. And I said, well, Daniel, talk to my head because it's not listening to me. I keep telling my head I can do it, and it keeps on making me walk up Mather Hill. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm giving up. And so he said, well, are you going to run tomorrow? I said, yes, I'm going to try. He said, uh, well, I'll, uh, what time? I'll meet you out in front of your house. I'll, do, I'll run with you. I said, Daniel, it's not going to work. I've tried and tried and tried. I've just failed every solitary time. But sure enough, Daniel's out there beside me the next morning. And you know what? With him running beside me step by, now he could have run 10 times as fast as I was, but he just kind of kept pace with me. And uh, every time I started, you know, we, we, I, I remember when, this is the test now. We're, gonna, we're headed toward Mather Hill. And I just kind of kept my eye on Daniel, and he's like urging me on, saying, you can do this. And I made it for the first time all the way up Mather Hill. And I, I did the whole 5K for the first time. And, uh, and when we were done, Daniel said, see, I knew you could do it. And I said, Daniel, actually, I feel like you kind of slowed me down. I think I could have run that faster. <laughs> so he said, well, I'll meet you in front of your house tomorrow. The next day, we knocked two minutes off my 5K total, just like that. And I'll tell you why I was off to the races. Uh, now, Daniel said, well, now you can run a 5K. I mean, that was all my goal was, was just a 5K. And then Daniel said, but you know, there's this 10K that you could run, and then there's a 10-mile you could run. And, and ultimately, in February of 2021, Daniel enrolled me in a half marathon. I think it was the Publix half marathon. Uh, Olympic athletes were training in that marathon. I was going to do in the half, but I said, Daniel, that's impossible. Like, I, I could not even run a 5K not long before like, this is just this way too much, way too much. Now, my wife was going to run as well, but she can do those. And so Daniel was going to go with the weak link and run alongside me. And it was the biggest, hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life. I said in that day I ran two races. I ran my first half marathon and my last half marathon all in one. <laughs> but on that day, Daniel ran beside me step by step. The last three miles is on the NASCAR track down there at the racetrack. And uh, I, honestly, uh, my heart rate was like going higher than it ever had. It's probably not legal to be that high. And uh, I'm sweating profusely. Every part of my body is aching. But I crossed the finish line. And I was blown away to think that, I, I tell you what, the only time, the fastest movement I had in the whole time was right after I crossed the finish line between that, that place and the medical tent. I ran so fast. They just saw me and sat me down and started you know, toweling me off and giving me Gatorade. Um, but I'll tell you something. I saw the difference it makes when someone walks with you, when someone goes beside you. It, stuff that was absolutely impossible wasn't impossible. When someone who believed in you said, I'll go beside you, I'll pace myself, I'll encourage you. In fact, the, one of the words for the Holy Spirit is the word paraclete, it's a Greek word, which basically means someone who comes alongside. That's a word for the Holy Spirit, who comes alongside your life. What is the potential for a life that has the Holy Spirit going with them wherever they go? What is the limit? And I, I just believe there's some people here this morning who have given up and said it's impossible. But you don't know what the Holy Spirit can do when he walks alongside you. And so I want you to look at the difference it makes when the Spirit walks alongside your life. And, uh, and there's, you, you heard the, the passage beautifully read this morning for us from Matthew 28. And we know this is the Great Commission. And it, it tell, it's the last words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Matthew before he ascends to heaven. And, uh, and, he, and he says something interesting. He's, he's going to talk about the fact that he will be with us. Now, you need to understand that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament, but, but the Holy Spirit did not come upon every person. He only came upon people that had an assignment. So if your assignment was to build the tabernacle, it, the Bible says the Holy Spirit would come upon the craftsmen. Or if you were King Saul and you're assigned to be the king, then the Holy Spirit would come upon you to help you be king. Or if you're Samson and your assignment is to deliver the Israelites, then the Spirit would come upon you and enable you to have superhuman strength to deliver the Israelites. But if your assignment was over, or if you, you, you rejected God's call in your life, if you disobeyed God, 
then in the Old Testament, God could remove his Holy Spirit from you. He removed it from Saul. Tragically, it says that the Holy Spirit was taken from Samson and he didn't even realize it was God until he began experiencing defeat. Um, and the Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you in the Old Testament, is to enable you to do a task. Now in the New Testament, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon every believer. You don't have to be a king. You don't have to be a Samson. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit, and he's never leaving. But, but people, I want you to understand, the Holy Spirit still wants to equip you. Sometimes we think the Holy Spirit's role in our life is to give us a happy, comfortable life. Folks, you don't need the power of God to have a happy, comfortable life, a selfish life. But to do what God wants you to do, you're going to need the power of God. And so when you come to this great commission, I want you to understand the context here because Jesus is going to give an amazing promise. But the promise comes in the midst of an assignment. And so in verse 16, it says, Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. So all 11 disciples who are still living, Judas, of course, is dead by now, all 11 are going to go up to Galilee, three days' walk from Jerusalem, and they're going to climb a mountain where Jesus had said to come. It's the last time Jesus will be speaking to these disciples. And, and the context suggests to us that it's not just the 11 that pretty well all the key followers of Jesus are going to be up there on that mountain. And they're going to have their last mountaintop experience, if you will, with Jesus before he ascends to heaven. Folks, I tell you, we all like mountaintop experiences. But can I tell you that mountaintops are never meant just to be a place of, 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 of permanence. It's, it, you're, we're not intended to live on a mountaintop. We're meant to be equipped on the mountaintop filled on the mountaintop, inspired on the mountaintop, and then we're always sent back into the valley. We, some people will say, I'd love to just be at church all week. That, wouldn't that be glorious? But church is simply preparing you for Monday morning. It's getting your, your focus on God filled with the Spirit, sin dealt with, so that Monday morning you can be on mission with God. And so he gets them on the mountain, and it says when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that interesting? In every gathering you have just like this, there will be those who will worship and there will be those who doubt. It's not uncommon. Even Jesus, if you can imagine, all the people on that mountain presumably have seen Jesus when he was alive. They've all been face to face with him at some point. And yet when they see him raised from the dead, there's some doubting. I would think that would have settled most doubts. A guy that you've known for three years that was dead, now he's standing there talking to you, but even then there were those who doubted. And I think that's important because when you get to verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now he says that because in our day, we would have assumed that Jesus would have said, now I'd like to know what all of you disciples think. Who here feels up to trying to evangelize the whole world? Who'd like to go make disciples of all nations? Who feels they're gifted to do that? But he doesn't do that, right? Because he has all authority. This isn't a group decision. This is not a popular vote. Jesus, as my father has always said, God doesn't give suggestions. He gives commands. And when Jesus is speaking you're receiving a command. It's not up for discussion. It's not up for, well, sorry, Jesus, for those here who are gifted at world evangelization, I'm sure they'll be glad to take on that assignment. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to command everybody to go and make disciples. Everybody. Now, remember, he's speaking to people who are doubting. He doesn't say, now, those of you who just worship me, go make disciples. Even the doubters are being told, you go make disciples too. He doesn't say those of you with the gift of teaching, with the gift of discipling, with the gift of evangelism, you go make disciples. You know what he's saying? He's saying, if you are one of my disciples, you have been commanded to go and make disciples. Every one of you. Don't tell Jesus you're not gifted enough to obey one of his commands. 
If he commanded it, you're obligated to do it. And so he says, go, therefore. And that word go, of course, is not the main command. It really means as you're going. But uh, again, as my father famously said in his book, Experiencing God, uh, too many of Jesus' disciples want to go with Jesus, but they don't want to get out of their boat. We want to stay in our fishing boat, but call ourselves a disciple of Jesus. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, it means you've got to get out of your boat. You know, when Jesus came to Peter and Andrew and James and John, he came beside their boat on the Sea of Galilee. It doesn't say that Jesus looked at them and said, believe in me. You see, there are those today who think that they're disciples because they believe in God. You're not a disciple because you believe in God. Jesus didn't stand there and say to the, the fishermen, just have a Bible study each week about me. Just study about me, and that will make you a disciple. That's not what makes a disciple. Be a good person, you'll be a disciple. No, to be a disciple meant you had to get out of your boat and follow Jesus. You had to go where he led you to go. There's way too many people who call themselves a disciple of Jesus and they've never followed Jesus anywhere. They're not going anywhere where he's leading. They're sitting comfortably in the same fishing boat they've been in all their life, but they want to call themselves a disciple of Jesus. My father said, when you go in to make disciples of all nations, I was with my dad one time in a church service, and he asked everybody, he said, do you believe this command of God? Do you believe that we're commanded to go into all the nations and make disciples? And, uh, and, and everyone raised their hand. And then he said, and so how many of you have valid passports? He said, because if you don't have a valid passport, you don't believe this command. Because you've been told to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, I know you can reach nations here in America, but are you prepared for God to have you go somewhere as well? If you're not going anywhere, I question whether you're a disciple. We have far too many people who want to stay right at home all the time, even on Sundays, but they want to call themselves a disciple. If you're a disciple, you'll be going somewhere, and you'll be making disciples. And notice what it says. It says to make disciples of all nations. So that means that you are not a disciple of Jesus unless you are making a disciple. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, he's going to lead you to a place of making disciples. He's going to lead you to a place of being on mission for him. And you're going to, in verse 20, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So you have not made a disciple. By the way, what was the last thing in this book that Jesus commanded people to do. Make disciples, right? And so you have not fully made a disciple until they are not only making disciples, but they're teaching them everything Jesus commanded them to do. By the way, do you know everything Jesus commanded us to do? You can't teach others what you don't know yourself, can you? Do you know everything that Jesus has commanded us to do? We need to know that so we can teach others. And then you get to the end of this whole passage and it gets to the very last thing, which is a lot of people's favorite verse in this whole book. And it says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's where God says, I'm with you. By the way, this is, as you know, many people who, are, who refuse to get on airplanes claim this verse for their justification. That they'll say, Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. And so... There's many that would say, I'm not getting on an airplane because of that. But, but for many, it's their favorite verse because it says, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Isn't that a beautiful promise? If you ever think God's gone anywhere, if you ever think Jesus has left you, go back to this verse. He said he would never leave you. That's why, you know, it's interesting. I'm in churches all the time, and the number one thing I hear people pray in church is, God, would you be with us today? And I feel like Jesus sometimes was just going to lose his patience and say, read verse 20. I said I'd never leave you. I said I'd be with you always. Why do you keep asking me to be with you? Jesus said he'd always be with us. But do you understand the context? The context of this verse is going on mission with God. And Jesus was saying, when you go on mission with me, I will always be with you. And no matter what scary place obedience might take you, 
No matter how difficult the assignment might, might seem, just understand this, I will be with you. And I just want to suggest to you that God, if you're a Christian, God is always going to be with you. He's never going to leave you. But when you go on mission with God, you will experience the powerful presence of God in your life in ways you never would have experienced it if you were sitting home watching television. Can I, can, now you could binge watch your favorite show on TV all evening and God is with you. But you probably won't feel him all that much. I tell you what, you leave the comfort of your house and you go and make disciples of all nations, you'll feel the power of powerful presence of God in your life in ways you've never felt him before. And when you feel the presence of God walking alongside you, enabling you to do things that only God can do, you'll never want to live your life any other way again. There's a wonderful story in, in, in Judges chapter 6, the story of Gideon. You remember Gideon? He's the cowardly youngest child of a farmer, and he's, he's hiding in a hole in the ground, threshing wheat, because the, the Midianites uh, have, have invaded the land and he's scared he'll be seen holding back food from the, the oppressors, the Midianites. And so he's, he's living in fear. And then all of a sudden an angel approaches him and says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Now, you see, I could never have been an angel because I could never keep a straight face with some of the messages God would send me to give. Like, there's a guy hiding. He's scared to death. And the angel says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. There's nothing mighty or valorous about that guy. He's hiding in a hole in the ground. He's scared to death. But what was, what was the angel saying? If you want to go with God, God goes with you in power. And you will be. You don't need to be a mighty man of valor to hide from your enemies, to live in fear but to take on 100,000 enemy soldiers with 300 of your own men, that's going to take the power of God. Spend your whole life living in fear, trying not to face anything you think is impossible. You don't need the powerful presence of God. Notice what Gideon says. He says, Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? I love that question. Gideon's heard all the stories about Moses and the ten plagues in Egypt and so on. And he's saying, God, angel, we, I've heard all these awesome stories about how powerful God is. But I've never seen a miracle in my entire life. Have you ever felt that way? You think, wow, wouldn't it have been awesome to live in the Bible times when God did miracles? And then you hear about people in our day experiencing miracles. You say, I wish I had their life. I wish I was the pastor of that big church. I was a missionary where God's working in that part of the world, but I'm just an ordinary person. I've never seen a miracle my entire life. It must just be for special, super spiritual people. And so Gideon is saying, God, if you're so great, why have you never done a miracle in my world, my life before? And again, I, I could never have been an angel because I would have had such a bad mouth. I would have just, I couldn't have helped myself. And I, if I'd been that angel, I would have said, Gideon, what do you need a miracle for? You're living in fear. You don't need the power of God to live in fear. You can do that in your own ability. You're, you're, you're hiding. You're afraid. You're a coward. You're, you feel inadequate. Well, you can feel inadequate without the power of God. But you climb out of that hole you're in and you go on mission with God, then you're going to need the power of God. And Gideon, thankfully, had the courage and faith to climb out of that hole and start believing God. And his whole nation soon felt the impact. Folks, I'll tell you, my question is, what are you doing right now that requires the power of God? What are you attempting right now that requires a miracle? What are you doing in your life that if God doesn't intervene and help you, you're going to face plant? because it's impossible for you. Some of us never experience miracles because we never attempt anything that requires one. But Gideon had lived his whole life in such a way he didn't need a miracle, so he hadn't seen any. But when he got out of that hole, all of a sudden, he needed a miracle, and he needed it fast. And I'll tell you what, thousands of years later, we're still reading about him and being inspired by a man who decided, I'm tired of living in this hole 
without the powerful presence of God enabling me to do what only God can do. And throughout history, we've seen moments where people did the same thing. You know, there's a, if you've ever read the biography of Billy Graham, we, you know, when we think of people used powerfully by God, we always think of people like Billy Graham. And, but, you know, when Billy Graham started out trying to be a preacher, uh, he didn't have the power of God in his life. <laughs> in fact, you read his first story, first time he ever preached a sermon. He, uh, he, he didn't know for sure what to preach. He hadn't really written any of his own sermons. He'd borrowed sermons from other people he'd read about and tried to make them into his own. And uh, when he was going to his first sermon, he wasn't sure which of these sermons he had he should preach. So he brought, he had four sermons he'd worked up at that point. He never preached any of them before, but he brought all four, trying to wait to the last moment to decide which one he should preach to the people that were gathered. And so finally it was time to preach. He preached the first message, and time raced by so fast, he thought, I don't know that that's, that's adequate. So he just took out sermon number two and preached it. And he's still feeling like something's missing here. So he thought, well, there's still time. I'll preach my third sermon. Finally, he preached all four sermons. And he, four sermons, his first time out. And he went and sat down, looked at his watch. It had been eight minutes. He had preached four sermons in eight minutes. That was Billy Graham. After that time, he realized, if I do this in my strength, it's going to be pathetic. I'm not going to keep doing this unless I know God does it with me, that God's hand is upon me, that God goes with me when I preach. And he settled some things with God, and the, the results afterward became obvious. He preached a sermon, and people would just be filling the front to come to Christ because they knew that they just heard from a man of God. I love the story of Charles Finney. He was an evangelist in the 1800s, and he was, he'd been a lawyer, and he was in a, in a safe legal practice, a, a good living, uh, making a, a, a comfortable living, and, and then God got a hold of him and said, I want you to go with me to do stuff you've never done before, to be a preacher, an evangelist, and so he went. And one of the, my favorite stories about Finney, 1826, he he went to uh, Utica. He was going to preach a series of meetings there. And uh, his, his brother-in-law was a superintendent at a local factory. And so his brother-in-law said, hey, come by and I'll show you where I work. I'll show you the factory. It was a cotton mill. They're, they're doing all kinds of work with cotton. And, and so the, the, the superintendent and the, the owner of the, of the mill are walking through the, the, the various rooms. And they get to this very large room filled with loud machinery, uh, people all working at all the different uh, posts. It's, it's deafening. And uh, Finney goes in and just is looking at it. And there's, there's two women working at a table just not too far from him. And they recognize him. This is that out-of-town evangelist. And these two women, they, they, they make some kind of humorous comment to themselves. They're laughing about this evangelist who's walked in the room. And Finney just kept looking at him. Finney stepped a little closer, got within 10 feet of the table, and the Spirit of God, the presence of God on Finney was so powerful that these two kind of sacrilegious, sarcastic women, as they saw this man of God approaching their table, they were suddenly overcome with the presence of a holy God. And one of the women literally fell to her knees and began to sob as she realized, here's a holy man and I'm making fun of him. My life is a disaster. And she was so convicted at her own sin that she just began to weep. And then the lady next to her starts weeping. And then people at the other stations begin weeping. And it spread all through that entire factory until finally the owner said, listen, I think right now it's more important that these people get right with God than that we keep on producing product. And they shut down the meeting, gather, or the, the work, put everyone in a room, had Finney preach to that group. And most of them were born again by the time Finney walked out of that factory. I thought to myself, folks, I don't know that I'm ever going to see something like that, but I'll tell you, should it be obvious when God's presence is upon you? When you go to work, when you talk to your neighbor, when you talk to a stranger, is there some sense in which God's powerful presence is going with you? And people can tell you're different than all the other, other neighbors. You're different than all the other colleagues. There's something about you. I I can't explain. I, I tell you what, it's an, uh, it's an amazing thing when someone says to you, there's something about you, I can't figure it out, but you're different than anyone else I've ever met. Isn't it awesome when people can tell that God goes with you? 
There's a beautiful story of Corey Ten Boom. You know her story. She was arrested for trying to rescue Jews during World War II. She and her sister Betsy were sent to a concentration camp, so eventually got to Ravensbrück, were put into barracks number 28, and, and her assignment was to go to one of the most horrific, awful places in all of human history, to the darkest places, places of death and evil. And she went into the most hopeless, dangerous place imaginable. But she and her sister had kept a Bible. Everything else, their jewelry, their possessions, their clothes, everything had been taken away, but they were trying to smuggle a Bible into a concentration camp in which they were being searched and checked all the time. And it's just a miraculous story of how these two sisters could conceal a Bible when they had nowhere to conceal it. And they get this Bible into the barracks. This barracks was designed to house 400 women, and they had crammed 1,400 women into the same barracks. There were nine, ten women sharing beds and these women are angry and they're bitter and they're cursing each other and they're fighting and they're fighting over who gets to sit near the window where they can at least get some fresh air at night and uh, in the midst of this horrific environment these two godly sisters just begin to read the scriptures together and to talk about what God's word says and people begin listening and gathering and, and clamoring for more. And there's all kinds of different languages represented. And so as these two Dutch women, they, they would read it in German, and then it would be translated into Russian and Czech and Polish and other languages. And all through those 1,400 women, they would have these amazing Bible studies. And lives were transformed. And hope came into the, one of the darkest places on the face of the earth. And later, Corey would say, I went to the darkest, most hopeless place you'd ever imagine a person could go, and I found that God went with me even there, and God's presence made a difference. I don't know where God wants you to go. Might be to your next door neighbor. Might be on a mission trip that this church does so well. Might be volunteering at some of the wonderful events in the community that this church does. Might be at work where God says it's time to start shining brightly in the workplace you're called. But I'm going to tell you something. All I, can, I don't know how it's going to work out for you, but I'll just tell you this. Jesus promised that when you go on mission with him, he will go with you. And you'll feel the difference. And everyone else will feel the difference. And they'll know it's not you they're encountering, it's God. When I was raising my kids, I, uh, I, just, I wanted my kids to know that I couldn't always be with them. I couldn't always be there for them, but God would go with them. And just to, just, the one thing I didn't want as a parent was for God to tell my kids to do something and them not to do it because they were afraid. Not to do it because they felt inadequate. I just said, listen, if God tells you to do something, he will go with you and he will equip you in any way you need equipping. So my oldest son that used to be on staff here, when he was getting through high school, getting to the 12th grade, I, I asked him, I said, well, Mike, um, what, what do you sense God wants you to do next? Where is God leading you after high school? He said, well, I don't know for sure, but he said, I know one thing, it's not to be a pastor. <laughs> I said, well, that's interesting that when God wanted you to know his will, he told you one thing he didn't want you to do. It would seem a little simpler if he just told you the one thing he did want you to do. I said, why do you think you, are, are you saying God doesn't want you to be a pastor? He said, well, I'm saying I don't want to be a pastor because I can't preach. I can't speak in public. I, I, I don't have that ability. And I just know God wouldn't want me to humiliate myself on a public stage in front of a bunch of people. I said, well, if God calls you to do that, he'll, he'll, he'll give you the ability. Well, he hasn't yet, Dad, so I'm not doing it. I said, well, he doesn't need to equip you for something you're not doing. Sometimes we don't get equipped because we don't need the equipping. We're not obeying. Sometimes you got to get out of your boat and start obeying before the equipping comes. And so I said, uh, d listen, just, I'm just telling you, if God wants you to do something, he's gonna, he he'll go with you. Well, it was a long journey for him. He had a number of God moments where God had to keep nudging him and nudging him. He finally went to college, and uh, he's still like, Dad, I'm just open to being a rock star, a millionaire, uh, but the, the preacher part, I'm not so sure about. That's, not, that's just not going to happen for me. And I just kept praying and saying, God, if you want him to do that, just give him the courage to get out of that 
fishing boat of his and out of that comfort zone and just see what it's like when you go with him. Well, we eventually, we were invited, my dad and I and Mike, all three of us, three generations, were invited to do a men's conference together outside of Toronto, Canada. And when I told Mike, guess what, Mike, your first speaking engagement is going to be with your dad and your granddad. Uh, I was a seminary president at the time. Dad was in his heydays traveling the world. And Mike is uh, like a first year or so college student and who's scared to death of public speaking. And he's like, I've got to follow Grandpa Henry? Like, they're going to hear him, and then people are going to say, instead of Henry Blackaby speaking this time, we're going to have Mike Blackaby speak? He said, nobody will want that. They'll say, no, we want Henry. And that's the way I felt when I preached with my dad. So I, I, but I said, but you got to go. So we, he, I had to nurse him and coax him, pretty well handcuff him to get him on the airplane with me. We flew to Toronto. The first night, Dad preached. It was powerful. Everybody loved hearing my dad. The next morning, I preached. My dad preached again. It was, it was good. Uh, and Mike's listening to us. And he's seeing all the feedback. But he knows on sun, Saturday night, it's just Mike. I don't know why they, they did it that way. You'd think they would have tag-teamed him with, with dad or something. But, but they, on Saturday night, it's just going to be Mike. He's the only speaker. So we've got them. And Mike is a nervous wreck. All that, he's just giving me that look. Like, Dad, if this goes bad, like, you're never going to hear the end of this. This is, this is my one and only time, kind of like my half marathon. This is my, my first and my last sermon I'm ever going to do. And I said, Mike, just trust God. He'll, you, you'll do great. And then you know, when, I, when Mike's not there, I'm thinking, God, help that boy. <laughs> I don't want him to face plant. He'll never do this again. And so the, the, the time is coming, and now the music is, we're singing the music. Mike is just a nervous wreck. Dad and I are sitting near the back. Uh, and now Mike Blackaby, young Mike Blackaby, is going to come, the grandson of Henry Blackaby, and, and he walks up there, and you can tell he's nervous. You can tell he's never done this before, and, but he's, he's just trying to do the best he can, and he's laying it out there. It's his first sermon. I'm sitting back there just praying, God, just help him, help, just be there for him, bless him. And, and uh, partway through, um, I'd say about two-thirds of the way through the sermon, all of a sudden, a man sitting in the audience just stands up. And I thought, oh, no, this can't be good. Someone's standing up in the middle of a sermon. And I'm thinking, is this guy going to say something? Like, is this guy going to have a, like, don't do this, Lord, to my, my son on his first sermon. Have some guy wanting to share a word right in the middle. Uh, is he going to correct my son? Is he going to say, uh, young, young Mike Blackaby just said this, but I beg to differ. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, what's he going to say? And, and, and the man starts walking to the front. He's walking toward the platform. And I can see Mike. I'm looking, and Mike's got these huge eyes. Like, what is about to happen? Is it, if this guy gets up and says he wants to say a word, do I let him? Do I, what do I do? And, and he's walking to the front, and I'm praying. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm kind of like, do I need to get out there and, like, intercept this guy or do something? And this man just keeps walking to the front. Finally, he gets right to the front, and he drops to his knees. And he just starts praying. And you can tell the man's under such conviction that he couldn't even wait until the altar call. There wasn't even going to be an altar call at the end of that service. This man was feeling the presence of God so much, he just declared an altar call. He just came forward in the middle of the sermon. And then other men start getting up. And the whole front starts filling up with people praying. And I'm, I'm looking up at Mike, and Mike's looking at the back to me like, Dad, what do I do? I've still got one more point in my sermon. And I just, from the back, I'm giving him hand motions. I'm saying, cut off the sermon. I said, just invite people forward. Have them pray. I'm giving all these hand signals. Like I'm, you know, sending signals to a baseball hitter or something. And, uh, and so Mike just says, you know what? I'm going to stop preaching. God is here. God is speaking. I just want, if you want to come and get right with God, you come on. The whole auditorium unpacked. I mean, there was hardly a man left in his seat. It's completely filled up. And I'm looking at Mike just in amazement, saying I didn't even preach a full sermon. But God was with me. And I got to see firsthand the difference it makes when you do something in the power of God and you do it in the power of your own. And uh, I'll tell you what, the next morning was the last morning. Dad and I were scheduled to wrap it up and speak. And I'm sitting between Mike's on my right, Dad's on my left. We're finished breakfast. I turned to, to Dad and said, hey, Dad, do you want to run back to our room and brush your teeth, get ready for the morning session? 
Dad said, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. So I turned to tell Mike, hey, Mike, we're going to go back to our room. And I see he's talking to, there's a man who's talking to him. And then I look, and there's six other men standing in line waiting to talk to Mike. Not one man had come to talk to me or Dad. (laughs) Seven men are waiting their turn to talk to my son because of what they heard him say the night before. I said, son, the next time you get scared because God's asking you to do something hard, just remember, if you want to experience the powerful presence of God, you can't play it safe. You can't live in fear. You got to get out of your boat and say, I want my own miracle. I want to experience the power of God myself. I don't want to read about it in a book about someone else who had the faith and courage to go with God. So God, if this is my moment to experience my powerful God working in my life, then I'm going to step up and I'm going to go with you. So we're going to have a moment of response. And I just want to encourage you. There are people in this room that you know God has some things for you as well. That God has been prompting you to go on a mission trip, to serve here in the church, to be a witness boldly at your workplace. And you, you've just held back. You've said, I'm too ordinary. I, I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm afraid. And you look at this promise where Jesus said, but if you will go, I will go with you. And you'll get to see what an almighty God can do to an ordinary person just like you. So I'm going to pray. And I want to invite you, if you would just want to, just by coming, and maybe just pray with one of the, the pastors who will be here. Say, I'm one of those people Richard talked about. I'm ready to get in the game with God. I'm ready to experience his power working in my life. Then you just come and take a moment and pray by yourself or with a pastor and say, would you pray that I don't get scared? I don't back out again like I have before. I've tried, like Richard tried to run a 5K and I always failed before, but I've got to understand, I just need to look to my side and see there's Jesus going with me. And he'll make sure that I get to the finish line that he has determined for me. So let me pray with you, and then we'll respond. Lord, thank you for these this morning, and I thank you that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. To the end of the age, you will be with us. But God, some of us have not really needed much of your presence because we haven't done anything for you that required it. We have, we played it safe, Lord. We've done what we thought we could do. But Lord, there's, there's a hunger inside us that says, I just long to experience the powerful presence of God in my life. Lord, I don't want to just wait and see you in heaven. I want to experience you now doing what only you can do. God, some of us have not taken this command seriously enough. We've assumed that there were others who would go. There would be others who'd make disciples. But this morning, we stand before your command that we are commanded to make disciples as well. And so, God, would you give us the courage to step out and say, God, I'm getting in the game, I'm getting out of the boat, and I'm going with you. And if I ever have doubts, if I ever have fears, I need to just look and see that you walk right beside me. You go with me, and you never leave me. Oh, God, help us in the days to come to have breakthroughs in our life and ministry like we never dreamed were possible. May we see ourselves doing things in your power we never dreamed we would ever see. May these be the greatest days of our service for you. And I'd pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.